Thank you. Um, wow, it looks so different from up here than it does sitting there. <laughs> so I also just want to thank everyone for um, inviting me here and welcoming me and my son here. It's been a real joy to have him with me. And um, it's also really extraordinary and a real privilege for me to sit with you all um, to begin with meditation and chanting and to create that field of consciousness that we can have this conversation in is really profound. Um, so I just want to acknowledge all of you and, and thank you for engaging in this, um, in this beautiful space and way of living. So we've been speaking um, a lot about kind of the infinite and the cosmos and the universe and also the very finite and that's, that's the ground of our being, and it's extraordinarily important. And I bow to my colleagues for their incredible brilliance and depth. Um, and tonight, what we're going to do is bring it more to the um, daily living and the particulars. And, and so what I'll be speaking about tonight is the art and science of mindfulness. And a few people have come up to me in the past few days and asked about mindfulness as a Buddhist practice. And so what I want to emphasize from the very beginning is mindfulness is an inherently human capacity. And the way I'll be speaking about it and the way I'll be teaching is um, not as a religious practice and not um, something that really transcends religion and culture and really has to do with what it means to be human. In fact, even though I have spent 20 years studying in more of the Theravadan Buddhist tradition in Thailand and also in Nepal, I always acknowledge my grandparents as my greatest mindfulness teachers, and they were agnostic Protestants, at, you know, who never meditated. So what I want to cover tonight is um, first just what is mindfulness so that we're all having a shared understanding. The second is, is mindfulness helpful? I was told that many of us here are interested in the science, and we've been learning some about basic science, but I'm going to be sharing some of the applied science, the clinically relevant science that says, are these practices helpful, and for whom, and in what ways? And then lastly, I want to talk a little bit about mindfulness and self-compassion. I believe that the heart is essential in any kind of transformational and spiritual practice. And it's really easy to get into the head when we're speaking of science. And so I'd like to invite all of us to stay connected to this body, right, this temple, to stay connected to our hearts, even as we're talking about the science. So the word mindfulness actually means to see clearly. So all we're trying to do is see clearly what's true, see clearly the nature of reality in this present moment. Is it loud enough for you? Not so much? Louder? <laughs> um, I'm not sure what I can do about it, but I'll keep trying. So the word mindfulness means to see clearly, and the way we do this is by paying attention, okay? Simply paying attention here in the present moment. So I've been speaking now for maybe four minutes. I'm curious, how many people have noticed that your mind has wandered off already? Come on, every single person. If yours hasn't, come see me after my talk. I want to bring you into my laboratory. I'll hook you up to the EEG monitors, right? Because you're an anomaly. Our mind wanders about 46.9% of the time. Okay, That's roughly half of your waking life that you're spaced out. Now, in this group, I would, I would guess it's actually a little less. That's the average, right? You all have been studying and training your minds, so it's different, but the mind wanders. And so part of learning how to see things clearly is learning simply how to pay attention, okay? Why we pay attention, our intention, is also important, right? Why am I paying attention? Why am I directing my energy and awareness here? And then also important, but not very often talked about, definitely not in my world of academia, is how you pay attention, your attitude, 
Okay, so I want to talk about each of these. And um, I developed a model in, in, it's called the tripartite model of mindfulness. You have to make it sound academic to get it published. But basically, it's just saying that mindfulness is intention, attention, and attitude. And it's kind of the state of consciousness that arises when all three of these qualities are present. So the formal definition from our book is mindfulness is the awareness that arises out of intentionally paying attention in an open, kind, discerning way. Okay. So I'm going to talk about each of these three elements. There's intention, attention, attitude. So our intention, as I said before, it's simply knowing why am I paying attention. It's your personal vision, your personal goal. For me, intention, it's like it sets the compass of my heart. It says, this is the direction I want to head. Okay. It's not a destination. It's a direction. It's saying, this is important to me. John Kabat-Zinn, who is one of my mentors, he says, your intention sets the stage for what is possible. Your intention sets the stage for what is possible. He says, they remind you moment to moment of why you're practicing, why you're doing any of the practices that you're doing. You have to remember your intention. Otherwise, it just becomes automatic pilot, right? Where you're just going through the motions and you don't even remember why you're chanting or why you're practicing. So intention helps us find our personal vision. This is from Suzuki Roshi. He says, the most important thing is to remember the most important thing. Right? That's it. The most important thing is simply to remember what is most important. So I'm going to tell a story about my son. I got permission beforehand. I just want to check. It's echoing a lot for me, but I want to find out how it is for you. The sound, it's not so good. Is there any, do I have any options? It's good for you guys? Awesome. All right. The back half of the room is doing great, and us up here is kind of echoey. So I did get permission to tell this story. Oh, now we're going to start playing with it. We'll see what happens. <laughs> so a couple of years ago, um, I was teaching in, in Europe, and I was away from my son Jackson for the first time for two full weeks. And it was the longest we had been apart. And on the plane ride home from Copenhagen, I got really anxious, like, oh, no, I've ruined our relationship, and I've probably broken our attachment bond, and you know, I study this stuff. So I got really nervous. And then instead of kind of spiraling into that shame of I'm not a good mom, I didn't do enough, I set a clear intention. I was like, what's the most important thing? Oh, yeah, I just want Jackson to know I love him. I'm home. We're safe. So I got home, I decided not to unpack, not to check my mail, my email, just to spend the day with him. And we both love going to the beach. So I said, hey, you want to go to the beach today? And he's like, sure. So I pack up a picnic lunch, and I get all his stuff, and I'm planning the perfect day at the beach. And I'm like, all right, Jackson, you ready to go? And he's like, nah, I don't feel like it anymore. I'm like, what? We're going to the beach, and I'm going to show you how much I love you, damn it. Right? <laughs> So he gets on his swimsuit, and we're heading out the door, and I'm at the car packing everything up. And he walks out the front door, and he just sits on our front porch. And I'm at the car, ready to go. Jackson, he doesn't even look up. And I notice in my body impatience starting to arise. And then I remembered, wait a minute, what's my intention? What's the most important thing? Oh, yeah, I just want him to know I'm home, and I love him. I don't, I don't care when we get to the beach. And so I walked back over, and I sat down next to him, and he was actually looking at these ants, which are pretty extraordinary. And I sat down, and I just remember this moment when his little body was literally then. It's big and strong now, but back then, a little body kind of leaned into me, and I could feel his shoulder touch my shoulder, and I could feel the sun on our backs. And that was it. That was the most important thing. And yet, we forget, right? We forget why we're doing what we're doing. We forget why we're practicing our spiritual practices. So intention is fundamental. So I just want to invite you for a moment, just because we're all here together, to close your eyes and just reflect on why are you here, right? In this moment, why are you here? What's most important?
feel your body and just let your intention, let it nourish you and motivate you. Good, okay. You can open your eyes. So that's the first element of mindfulness is just our intention, knowing why. The second element of mindfulness, as I mentioned, is our attention, right? This is learning how to focus our attention in the present moment. As I said before, our mind wanders 46.9% of the time, okay? So part of these practices that we're all learning are training the mind in how to be present so that we can see things clearly. We have between 12 and 50,000 thoughts every single day 95% of them are the exact same, right? And you all probably are starting to get a sense of those thoughts, right? What am I going to eat? Why did she do this? Why am I not smarter? Whatever they are, right? We have these thoughts that we just recycle. One of my favorite quotes, this is Emo Phillips. He says, I used to think the brain was the most wonderful organ in my body. Then I realized who was telling me this, <laughs> right? Right? We believe our thoughts. Our thoughts aren't real. So part of mindfulness is learning how to train our attention here so that we can stabilize it long enough to see clearly, right? If I'm trying to take a picture and I'm moving all around and I can't focus, I'm going to get a fuzzy picture. With mindfulness, we're trying to see clearly what's true right here even in this moment. So the third element of mindfulness is our attitude. And this is how we pay attention. And when I was first learning about mindfulness, I was at a monastery in Thailand. And I actually had gone to Thailand and Nepal to go trekking and to um, explore a little bit. I wasn't, I didn't, had never meditated before. And I met a monk who so touched me with his presence that when he invited me to come back to his monastery, I did. I left my friends and I came. And I, I didn't know anything about meditation, and he didn't speak any English, and I didn't speak any Thai. But he kind of pointed to my nose, and he said, you know, feel the breath come in and out. Focus your attention. And so I thought all meditation was was attention. And I started practicing, right? I woke up at 4 in the morning and paid attention. And I noticed, just as you all have seen with the mind, is that it would wander off. And so I'd bring it back and it'd wander off again, and I'd bring it back, just like you're doing here as I'm speaking to you, right? And I started getting more and more frustrated, like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do this, right? And I started judging myself, like, why are you, you're terrible at this. What's wrong with your mind? And who do you think you are? You think you could be a meditator? Or you think you're some spiritual person? By the third day, I started judging all these beautiful monks around me, like, why are they just sitting here, right? Luckily, a monk from London came who spoke English. And so on the fourth day, I had an interview with him. And I explained to him what was happening. And he looked at me with a lot of compassion and a little bit of humor. And he said, oh, dear, you're not practicing mindfulness. I said, what? He said, no, you're practicing judgment and frustration right, and anxiety. And then he said these five words that I've never forgotten. He said, what you practice grows stronger. What you practice grows stronger. We know this now with neuroplasticity. Our repeated experiences shape our brain. What you practice grows stronger. What he said is mindfulness has to do with the attitude with which we pay attention. If I'm paying attention in a judgmental, striving, forcing way, that's what I'm growing. If I'm paying attention with kindness, with compassion, with curiosity, those are the pathways I'm strengthening. So this is the Japanese kanji for mindfulness. And what's interesting, the top part means presence. The bottom part, shin, means mind, so presence of mind, or heart. They're interchangeable in Asian languages. So mindfulness could have been translated as heartfulness we've completely missed this dimension of mindfulness in the West, especially in academia. Does this make sense? 
this is kind of my model of mindfulness. And so I'm going to skip this poem, and I'll share it tomorrow at the workshop, because I know we're running short on time. So what I'd like to do now is I would like to invite you that mindfulness is not just a meditation practice. Mindfulness is a way of being. So right now, we're practicing mindfulness if we're paying attention in a curious, kind way. So the invitation is, as I move into the research and looking at, is mindfulness helpful, for you to stay connected to your body, to the present moment, and know that you're practicing right now. You're practicing. OK. So the question becomes, is it helpful? Is what we're doing helpful? Short answer, yes. <laughs> I know you want a little bit more. So there's been about four decades of research showing significant effects on both physical and psychological health of different kinds of meditation practices that involve mindfulness. In terms of our medical health, mindfulness has been shown to decrease psoriasis. It's a very uncomfortable skin disorder. This was one of the very first studies done. It was published in the Journal of Dermatology. And it was actually one of the studies that got me so excited about mindfulness because the, the traditional treatment for psoriasis is you stand in this kind of booth and you get photochemotherapy, right? You stand there naked and you get photochemotherapy. And you, it's you know not very comfortable. And um, what they decided to do is while they stood there to teach them meditation so that as you're standing there receiving photochemotherapy, you're practicing mindfulness. And what they did is they randomized people to receive the traditional treatment versus the mindful treatment, and they saw that their skin cleared 35% faster. They published this. No one believed them. They replicated it, published it again, Journal of Dermatology. It's also been shown to decrease chronic pain, fibromyalgia, symptoms of cancer, multiple sclerosis, tension headaches, hypertension, immune functioning in both people who are not well. One of the studies that um, I did early on in my career is looking at women with breast cancer and looking at how meditation impacted their immune system, which it, it increased their immune functioning. They've also looked at healthy, quote, normals and shown that it increases immune functioning. In just seven weeks, you can see a significant difference. More recent studies have shown that it increases telomerase, which is an enzyme that um, produces telomeres. And what we know is that the length of the telomere is it it determines how long you live. It's kind of our best marker of, of biological aging. And so what you see is older people have shorter telomeres, younger people have longer telomeres. But what's interesting is like when we look at our soldiers and our veterans who are coming home from war, their telomeres are short because they've been under so much stress and suffering. When you look at telomeres of people who are meditating, they're longer, okay? So we're seeing real physiological impact of these practices. You guys have already tasted and experienced these, but it's important for science to be documenting and demonstrating these effects. It's also been shown to decrease and benefit psychological health, decreasing depression, anxiety, panic attacks, insomnia, uh, binge eating disorder, attention deficit disorder, substance abuse. But for me, what became interesting after doing this kind of research for about 10 years is when I first studied meditation and mindfulness, the goal wasn't to reduce panic attacks or decrease skin disorders, right? I mean, the, the goal was really freedom. And so I became really interested in what are the positive psychological effects of, of meditation and how can we start to expand the paradigm that's focused so much on pathology. So I want to share a little bit of this research with you. It's been shown mindfulness and meditation to increase our self-awareness, our self-regulation, our empathy. Right? Empathy is one of the number one predictors in relationship health. It's been shown to increase self-efficacy, happiness, sense of control, our spiritual experience or our connection to something larger, our compassion, bless you, our moral development. It's been shown to increase our cognitive capacities, our attention, concentration, creativity, memory, academic performance. It reduces cognitive rigidity, right? Which means it increases our flexibility of thinking, our open-mindedness. And it increases ethical decision-making. 
I think that's fascinating that just practicing meditation increases ethical decision making. This was a study I conducted a couple years ago, and we decided to teach college freshmen meditation to see if it increased their ethical decision making. So I learned a couple things. The first is college freshmen are not very ethical. Um, you would be amazed. But what was interesting is that after seven weeks of meditation, you know, I never talked to them about ethical behavior. I never said, don't drink and drive or don't cheat or, which they do all the time. All we did is learn how to pay attention in a kind way to our own experience. And after the seven week course, all of a sudden they started making different ethical choices than the control group. So I think that's really interesting and has important implications for our world. What I find most interesting in the research, and um, we have the experts in this room that we can talk about more, but is the impact of meditation on the brain. And so I'm going to tell you about a couple studies, but first I want to give you just some basic background. This has nothing to do with meditation. This just has to do with the brain. So uh, one of my dear friends, Dan Siegel, gives this model of the brain. He says our, our fist is the perfect model of the human brain because you have the kind of early brain, the reptilian brain, the amygdala emotion center, and then the prefrontal cortex forms over it. This is our higher order reasoning, our emotional intelligence. So what happens in this part, it's the green part up here, is when there's higher activity in the left prefrontal cortex compared to the right, people report being more optimistic, more hopeful, more creative, more joyful, more vital. When you have the opposite, where you have higher activity in the right prefrontal cortex, people report being depressed, worried, anxious, distressed, okay? So when they looked at a Tibetan Lama who had been meditating for tens of thousands of hours, his brain was significantly different than the other 175 participants that they called in. He had much greater activity in the left prefrontal cortex. And when he was meditating on compassion, it even increased. So they wondered, you know, is this just a random artifact? Like, was he born this way, kind of born happy, and that's why he became a meditator? Or was this because of the tens of thousands of hours that he had spent and devoted his life to meditation? So they decided to do the gold standard in the West, which is a randomized controlled trial. And they looked at people who had never meditated before, who didn't really know anything about meditation. So they looked at biotechnology employees. And what they did is they randomly assigned them into a meditation group or a control group. At the four month follow-up, they also had significant left-sided activation. The people who were in the meditation group four months later had shifted the activity in their brain. So this is extremely hopeful, and I want to explain why. So in psychology, there's something called a happiness set point. It's similar to kind of our weight set point. You know, basically, you have a certain body type. You also have a certain temperament. And this is based on research that was replicated over and over again that shows if you win the lottery, you have a blip of happiness, you go back to baseline. If you're in a tragic accident and you become a paraplegic, you go down in happiness, but one year later, you're also back to baseline. So this is extraordinary in terms of if you were born happy, this is really good news, right? It doesn't really matter what happens to you. You're like a bobo doll and you know, life knocks you down, it pops back up, right? You get in a terrible accident, you're paraplegic, I would think that that would make me unhappy. And yet, one year later, they're back to their baseline. But I'm a clinical psychologist, and so the people I work with were not born happy. And then this is terrible news. Well, if I win the lottery, if I marry the perfect person, if I buy the house in, in the Bahamas, um, one year later, I'm going to go back to this state of depression, right? So what's exciting about this new research is it says, Although changing our exterior circumstances doesn't change our set point of happiness, changing our interior landscape can, right? So this is Richie Davidson and Mathieu Ricard. And Richie was the principal investigator of this study. And he, I think, won science, Scientist of the Decade or some big award, but um, wonderful neuropsychologist. And what he says is happiness can be trained because the very structure of our brain can be modified. What does that sound like? 
neuroplasticity, right? What we practice grows stronger. This is what that monk told me 20 years ago, probably never took a neuroscience class. What we practice grows stronger. Our repeated experience shapes the brain. So when you look at the brains of taxi drivers, right, their visual spatial mapping part is bigger and stronger because it's what they've been doing all day long. They've been practicing that. When you look at the brains of meditators, the part of the brain that has to do with attention, learning, self-awareness, self-regulation, empathy and compassion, it gets bigger and stronger. It's called cortical thickening, right, where we're actually growing new neurons in these areas. And this cortical thickening is correlated with practice, right? The more you meditate, the stronger your brain gets. So I like to think of this as we have these kind of super highways of habits, right? These neural pathways in the brain. And what mindfulness is allowing us to do is to pause and to start to build these country roads of compassion or patience or kindness, right? So in that moment with Jackson, when I was ready to kind of get to the beach and show him what a great mom I was and be on my agenda, mindfulness helped interrupt that pathway and help me step into a pathway of greater empathy and patience. What we practice grows stronger. What we're practicing right now, right now, is growing stronger, right? This moment matters. That, that was one of the, mo the biggest aha moments I've had, is this moment, like this one, this one. Not just like while I'm sitting at a monastery with my eyes closed, not just while I'm chanting, but this moment right here matters. And I remember when I really got that inside my body, I actually had kind of a panic attack. It was like, oh my God, I have to be perfect because if I'm feeling upset right now, I'm practicing that and it's getting stronger. So I had this, oh no, I have to be perfect. And then I remembered what the monk told me about our attitude. It's not so much we're trying to change or manipulate our experience, it's that we're learning how to hold it with compassion and with curiosity and with kindness. So it's like, I, I like to think of this big pot of mindfulness, or you can think of loving arms of a parent, and we're kind of throwing all our experience into it and we're cooking it with our kind attention. So it doesn't mean that you have to be happy all the time. You're allowed to feel what you feel. There's such permission in this practice and such grace and compassion. We hold it with our kindness. When mindfulness is missing this heartful dimension, what I see happen and what happened in my own life is it becomes one more way to beat ourselves up, right? One more way where you're not good enough. I know that you know what I'm talking about, right? That sense of somehow I'm not okay or somehow I'm not doing it right or somehow I'm not doing this life right. Do, do you guys know what I'm talking about? <sighs> what I've found in the last 15 years as a clinical psychologist is that this shaming ourselves, this self-judgment, it doesn't work. In fact, what we've learned in neuroscience is that when we feel ashamed, the centers of our brain that have to do with learning new behavior shut down. So think about that, right? I mean. If I really see something in myself I don't like and I shame myself, it actually locks it in. That's why the compassion piece is so important with mindfulness because if we're gonna truly see clearly, it takes a lot of courage because some of the stuff we're looking at isn't beautiful. And so we need to hold it with compassion. So I like to think of kind of when my mind starts reaching out for a thought that will shame me or that will judge myself, that it's almost like I'm reaching for a hot coal that will burn me. You know, and if I imagine Jackson reaching out for a hot coal, I'd say, no, that will hurt you. These judgmental thoughts don't help us. They don't help us change. Compassion, I believe, is what leads to true and lasting transformation. Seeing things clearly with compassion with compassion. 
So I want to share um, a clinical anecdote. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a professor. I'm also a clinical psychologist. And I used to work at a veterans hospital. So I worked with um, people who are coming home from war. And one of the very first groups that I led was for men who had been in the Vietnam War and had post-traumatic stress disorder and had been carrying this pain for a very long time. And I remember there's about a dozen men in the group. And there was one man that sat right about where you're sitting. And he never looked up. He just looked down the entire time. And we were learning about mindfulness and self-compassion and forgiveness, even for those parts of ourselves that seem unforgivable. And I remember one day he looked up and he looked right at me. And he raised his hand and he said something I'd never heard before. He said, I don't want to get better. He said, I don't deserve to get better. He said, what I saw, what I did, I don't deserve to get better. And then he looked back down at the floor, and he proceeded to tell us in very great detail what he had seen and what he had done. And I can still feel the horror of it. And I remember looking up at the men around the room to see what they were going to do with this information. And I could see that everyone saw that what he had done was wrong and was not OK and should never happen again. And yet there was no judgment. There was so much compassion in that room. And I remember inviting him to look up and, and to be witnessed by each of these men in their compassion and to actually see the possibility that he wasn't his past behaviors, to see that he could choose differently now in this moment. And you could see kind of that moment in his eyes where I was like, is this really possible? Can I let go of the past? Can I begin again in this moment? Can I actually see my humanity? What I've learned most from mindfulness is this attitude that we bring to ourselves is essential. The word compassion in Tibetan is considered incomplete if it doesn't include oneself. True compassion always includes ourselves. I'm going to say that again. True compassion always includes ourselves. Okay. So, I know what my next slide is, and it's not right for this moment. So I'm going to skip it for a moment. The point I really want to make is mindfulness, and I believe any spiritual practice, can be used as one more way to beat ourselves up. One more, Roger Walsh calls it um, golden shackles. And really, this practice is about self-liberation. It's about freedom. Freedom from our judgmental thoughts, freedom from our small sense of self that we've been talking about. True freedom, freedom that comes from seeing clearly with compassion. That comes from seeing clearly with compassion. And I was excited tonight we were speaking about the fact that Passover is coming up. And I heard that you do a big celebration on Friday. And I'm delighted I'm going to be here. And it was interesting because that's, that's the theme of Passover, too, is freedom. Freedom from the parts that enslave us. And Menace was speaking last night so beautifully about how all the religions are pointing to the same thing. And that there's these universal truths, and they're from the greatest, most expansive, to the most finite, to right here in this moment. And the only thing that really makes sense is kindness. Right? It's all so complex. It's all so mysterious. So I want to invite us to just take a moment and let our eyes close. And just feel your body sitting here. This was a lot of information on many different levels, emotional, cognitive. I want to help us bring it into our experience so we can digest, 
so often I find we cram ourselves full of information and it doesn't leave space to digest it and integrate it, just like eating too much at a meal. So see if you can just allow the resonance of what I've shared to sink into the body at a cellular level. These trillions of cells all dancing together. I love that image. Let this become part of that dance. And I invite you to feel how at some level you already know all of this. At some level, we're all simply reminding each other. Softening the body, letting it receive this information in its own way. And then just take a moment to reflect on one kind of golden nugget, one piece of all of this that you want to anchor in your body and really remember. Something you want to take with you. We know that people remember the peak of an experience and the very end. So right here is an opportunity to anchor in whatever feels most, most important, most valuable for you to take with you. Feeling the breath. Feeling the body. And then inviting all of us to dedicate the merit of this evening's practice, that it be of benefit. Feeling the gratitude that we have the time and space to practice together in this way. And feeling the gratitude for the part of yourself that resonates with all these teachings, that already knows this, that wise part of yourself that got you here. Feeling your own good heart Trusting it. We don't have to be perfect. We're all just learners. We're learning. So as you're ready, taking a deeper breath in and out. Let some light come back in through the eyes. Stretch your arms up above your head. Good. We have time for questions. Oh, we're allowed to do questions. Oh, that'd be so lovely. I would love to hear from you. I wasn't sure you were allowed to talk right now. <laughs> well, there's lots of rules, you know, and I want to follow them. So I would, <laughs> um, I would be delighted to hear any questions. And actually, what would I would really love to hear if maybe a few people could just share what was their one nugget that you're going to take with you. I would love to hear if you, someone would raise their hand to share what's Oh, you have to actually stand up and come to the mic. Yes, you you all, come. <laughs> I guess the mic is that right there. And you can come after her, yeah. Hi. Um, my 
my name is Sandy. I'm, I'm leaving in two days, and I've been here for almost three weeks. And um, all the classes that I've taken here have sort of come together, and you know, this symposium as well, just sort of as a sort of a tying a bow on it all. And the big piece that I think is most important is a remember what's most important and what really is your intention, because we can get really sidetracked with the quagmire of life and just, you know, oh, well, I want to get my apartment redone. Well, and then you end up running around like a crazy person, and the reason you wanted to get your apartment looking nice was to make you feel good. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm an interior designer. That's why I use that. But, you know, there's a lot of those kinds of things. And so just I'm going to really, really concentrate on what is the most important thing and what my attention is. So I really appreciate everything that you brought tonight. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, Sheena. Um, I, uh, one word that I remembered yesterday in the, our friend here's conference was the mind, you know, like it's tricking us. And so when we say mindfulness, it's more tricks and feels. So when you said heartfulness, it felt like and simply change of words, change of perception, and not to encourage the mind, which is our friend too. But heartfulness, that's a big gift I will remember. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What are some other do you want your hand or you just other questions or other things that people are taking with them in terms of their nuggets. It's beautiful when you share because you actually remind all of us. So thank you for those. Yeah. Hi, that was really beautiful. Um, the thing that stuck with me was the compassion element. I find it's exactly as you said, even with the meditation, I'll find myself judging myself for this. Mm -hmm. There's this lack thereof, this standard that I still don't meet. Yeah. And um, it's, so I feel like so much of our society is based on competition, always comparing ourselves to everything around us, including in our head. And mm -hmm. I, I, that really stuck with me. That was that golden nugget was that compassion. I think Beautiful. it's revolutionary. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, for me, oh, you can come up. For me, that was a real turning point in my meditation practice. I remember one of my teachers said to me, she said, I want you to notice the tone of your voice when you bring your mind back. So the mind wanders off, which it does. How do you bring it back? And all of a sudden, I noticed I was beating myself, right? Come back. Why can't you do this? You've been doing this for a decade. What's wrong with you? Instead of, oh, sweetheart, interesting. Your mind wandered off. Come back. And I do now. Like I, I celebrate every time I come back because it's like, oh, I'm here again. This, this is home. I'm delighted. Right? So thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. This has been really beautiful. And the compassion piece, when, when you were talking about um, how true compassion always encompasses yourself, I think that's something that really stuck out to me because... Um, in the notion of selflessness, like there, sometimes like you forget yourself, mm -hmm. and but you can't give from an empty vessel, and so unless uh, you know you let it include yourself in the self that you're serve, you know, it, to just look at us as like one, you know, instead of like you know taking yeah like having the separation and feeling like you you have to. I think you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and I agree. And yes, exactly. I mean, the Buddha said you can search the whole world and not find anyone more or less deserving of your love than yourself, right? And it's if we see ourselves as separate, then we think it's okay to help them even if I'm hurting myself. But if we see that we're all completely connected, it makes no sense, Yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or other nuggets that you want to share? Mm. 
You're so brave to come up here. I can't believe you guys have to stand and walk in front of 300 people just to ask a question. <laughs> Thank you for your beautiful presentation. Um, the thing that resonated with me that really touched me, the little nugget that I took, was self-compassion. Um, uh, but it's interesting that we have to learn self-compassion, that we're not sort of born with it. So there seems to be something of value to have to grow into this notion of self-compassion. So is there value in the stages that come before self-compassion where you're sort of beating yourself up? Is there, is there merit to that? You know, is there? You're like, please, because I've been doing it for so many decades. <laughs> oh my God, there's just, yeah, I don't even want to tell you about it, but yeah. Because we're laughing because we know. Yeah, oh. Because we're all doing it. Thank you for laughing. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think the question is, why are we like this? I, I, I ask that a lot. Of, like, why is there so much collective shame? Why is there so much self-judgment? Because if I think of what I would want for my son more than anything in the world, are you awake? More than anything in the world is, is for him to love himself and to know that he's valuable and worthy more than anything, right? And yet somehow we're trained to feel that judgment and shame is the, that, that we're actually boastful or prideful if we actually care about ourselves. And um, I'll actually share a story I wasn't going to share here, but I'm going to. Um, so I, I was divorced about eight years ago. We talked about this one too, Jackson. Um, and uh, it was a really hard period in my life, and I had more shame than I've ever felt about anything because I come from a generations of no one's ever been divorced. And I would wake up every morning and feel that pit in my stomach of like, I've failed, right? Mm -hmm. And we all know that somewhere in our lives where it's just, I, I messed up, I didn't do it right. And um, for months, and I remember going to my teacher, she said, it sounds like you're practicing a lot of self-judgment, negative shaming pathways, you know, try to hold them with compassion. And then she said, and I'd like you to see if you can cultivate a, a positive, kind pathway. So I'd like you every day to say, I love you, Shauna. And I looked at her and I'm like, no, <laughs> right? I'm like, I'm a scientist. Like, you think I'm some hippie? Like, I'm gonna say, I love you, Shauna. So she looked at me, she knew I wasn't going there. So she said, fine, when you wake up in the morning, I'd like you to say, good morning, Shauna. I was like, okay, I can do that. So I went home, I'd say, good morning, Shauna. And actually it was kind of nice. Like I'd wake up in the morning, instead of all those judgmental thoughts, I'd be like, oh, hold on, I gotta say good morning, Shauna, first. And so I did this for a couple months and I'd go into Jackson's room, I'd say good morning, Jackson, and then I'd start texting my friends good morning and it kind of became my practice. So a few months later I went back to her. She said, so how, how's that good morning thing going? I said, amazing, it's great, it's really supporting me. And then she had this twinkle in her eye and all of a sudden I knew that she had won. <laughs> and she said, <laughs> You've graduated. Now I want you to say, good morning, I love you, Shauna. And so I started doing it. Good morning, I love you, Shauna. Good morning, I love you, Shauna. Felt nothing. A couple of months later, still doing it every single day, and all of a sudden I remember putting my hand on my heart, good morning, I love you, Shauna, and I felt it. I felt my Nana's love, I felt my mother's love, I felt that love, and I remember just crying, and I couldn't believe that was the first time in my adult life I'd ever felt love from myself to myself, like why was that wrong? Why was that so shameful to, it, 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 it was the most extraordinary moment. And you know, I wish I could say that every day since then has been total bliss and joy and I never judge myself. And that's not true. But that pathway's there. It's there and I practice every day. So I offer that, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Just a question on your experience, maybe your knowledge on the research. So a little bit of context. The problem I'm having with meditation is that it's often applied to smaller problems, is that people with a relative amount of privilege are using it to manage stress rather than it's often not used with our and to grapple grasp with our biggest problems, you know. And so I'm really thinking of I'd just done work in a prison before I got here, and then the neighborhood I'm coming from. In the prison, we had to count the pencils bef before and after class to make sure no one left with them because at the hint of anything, you'll get stabbed. And that, that, that's, it's that quick, an insult, a judgment, and it's that fast. In, in the neighborhood I'm from, I know people that 
they'll pull out the gun. The guns come out with a couple drinks, a couple insults, and it's it's that it's that quick to draw. These are kids that you know sometimes as young as nine nine years old. Do you know of any examples of prison and gang intervention with meditation? Because that's where I really want to see it applied. Is where is where the love is least. Yeah. That's where it needs to hit, and hit and and and, and be introduced first. Yeah. Thank you. What stay? What's your name? Derek. Thank you, Derek. Um, it's such an important question, and I think it's one of the challenges right now because when you look around at most of the meditation communities and the places I go and teach, it's mostly white, upper middle class. And these are the questions that are being asked. What I'm happy to say is there is a lot of work being done right now in the prison systems and even in the juvenile systems. My last PhD student, his dissertation was we, we developed a mindfulness program for the juveniles that he was working with. And he had come actually he had been a juvenile delinquent, recovered, gone to graduate school, getting his PhD. And that's why he said, I want to work with this group that no one's paying attention to. And so we did the study two years ago. It's published. He just finished writing his book. And more and more, I'm seeing this work being done. Jack Kornfield, who's one of my teachers, he is doing a lot in the prison systems. We're bringing into the veteran hospitals, who you know the men who have been at war. So I think it's happening. And so much more attention needs to be put here and so much more resources and research. Because what I found is that when you do the research and you show the science and you say this is helpful, that's when it starts to happen. And for me, one of the things that's become most important is how to integrate this into our educational systems and into with our children. So at this very young age, you know, we, their brains get shaped in this way that compassion makes sense and self-compassion makes sense and I value myself. Or that's just what they're taught from an early age. So I really appreciate your question. It's an important one, and it's it's in the conversation right now. Where's the opposition and inertia? What forces are, are, are pushing against it? You know, it's interesting. I have to admit, so far, I, I haven't found a lot of opposition. People are actually really welcoming. I've, I've been kind of astounded by how much is coming in, and I'm just grateful for it. I just got a letter actually maybe four months ago from a female prison guard saying that she had read my book and she wanted to start doing these teachings in, in the prison system. So I sent her all my workbooks and material and she's just doing it. And I actually spoke at the um, LA, um, the prison system there for all the guards and the mental health employees, not for the prisoners, but for the people that were working with them because their conscious needs to be cared for as well. So I think it's happening and it's slow and people need to keep asking the questions and it's definitely not a perfect system by any means. You can get the guards, you can get anyone. So. Yeah, I, I, sure. I agree. Thank you. Thank you for your question. So now I think I'm officially out of time. I'm so happy, though, that we got to interact a little. I was saying this is my favorite part. So I hope you come to the workshop tomorrow. And I do think someone else is coming up here now, maybe. I keep looking at her. <laughs> I'm done. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>